aquatic system is going to have a lesser or reduced effect on human health in the environment when compared to competing products. And so we're often taking two products and comparing them to each other to try to figure out which ones are safer, um, which ones are more energy efficient, which ones make less waste. You might also hear the terms environmentally preferable, purchasing that's a mouthful, that's EPP, um, or buying green. Sustainable purchasing is a broader term that you might also hear interchangeably, and usually uh, that also means that you're taking into consideration not just environmental impacts, but social impacts, equity, social environmental justice, um, and some of these broader uh, concepts. But today we're mostly going to focus on EPPs, um, so environmentally preferable products. Those are products that yield environmental or health benefits. Um, the ones we're most commonly talking about are energy efficiency, waste prevention, water efficiency, and toxics avoidance. So today, because of this conference, uh, we're looking at things holistically. We wanted to uh, make sure that there are not trade-offs among these different um, uh, benefits. So you could compare two different products, um, a, an LED light bulb with a compact fluorescent light bulb, for example, and you can see, oh, this has energy efficiency benefits for the LED, it also lasts longer, so we're gonna have less waste, and it's mercury-free, so we get a win-win-win uh, when we can look at some of these products. It doesn't always happen this uh, easily, but um, sometimes it does. When we think about products, some of you are coming in from the waste side, and some from the toxic side, and some from the energy side. We tend to be pretty siloed in some of this, um, but we do really want to try to look at products from every life cycle stage. Um, and I don't want to scare you because it sounds like it's going to be a lot of work, but just as you're thinking about products, think about um, uh, the different elements of it and where there might be opportunities to green those products during um, you know, waste uh, or the, the generation and the material manufacturing, transportation, um, utilization, and disposal. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that as we go along the way. The question that I know is often in people's minds is, how do I know which products are green? And there's so much greenwashing out there. How do I really figure this out so that I'm not steering people in the wrong direction? And so I wanted to just uh, put this into uh, a few concepts for you to think about. Greenwashing, which is uh, you know completely unverified <laughs> claims, um, and you'll see a lot of these. Sometimes the manufacturers themselves um, create their own eco labels, and it can be very confusing. And so trying to figure out, is this actually, what's behind this claim? What's behind this label? And I'll tell you some easy ways to do that. Um, sometimes you'll see a claim and it looks correct, but it's just not verified. And sometimes that can be okay if, if it's specific enough. So if something says 100% recycled, then that can be um, a good claim. You do want to probably know if it's post-consumer or not. Low VOC, mm, that's vague. That's going to end up in the greenwashing category. And BPA-free could be um, okay, but it may not be if you know the products are always BPA-free or if it, there's a substitution. So you really want to try to avoid the things on the left, the greenwashing, the unverified claims, um, unverified environmental standards. We have EPAs. Um, uh, compliant, uh, compliance for recycled content, they have guidance, would be great. I know Danielle was talking with you about this earlier. If there was a way to verify, have that claim verified, the same way safer choices, that would be really helpful. Um, and then all the way on the right, you have certified claims, and that's really your strongest tool um, for making sure that the products are really great, that there are um, certifications that, that will verify the claims that a product is environmentally preferable. And it is challenging because different um, certifications apply to different product categories. So as I mentioned, greenwashing is the act of misleading uh, consumers about either the environmental practices or the uh, environmental benefits of a product or service. And sometimes that can be made up by the manufacturer that this green promise that came out from a paint company. Uh, we don't know really what's behind that. So you, your job is going to be to try to f figure out which eco-labels and claims are on there and whether those are actually uh, legitimate or not. There's a lot of irrelevant claims, so I mentioned that in that table there. Um, 
this one, you can see where the arrow is. It says down there, um, green product, the item has been designated by the manufacturer as an environmentally preferable product because it's USDA certified bio-based product. Well, it is a paper plate. Every paper plate is a bio-based product. And so um, that's really challenging because sometimes USDA bio-based is legitimate and sometimes it's not. And so one of the roles of my nonprofit is to, to uh, work with those certifiers to make sure they're really making a claim that makes sense in the marketplace and is designating a product as environmentally preferable. Sometimes the claims are weak. I mentioned, and I'll go into detail, about EPA has set minimum guidelines for recycled content. Well, here's a product, it's a file folder, legitimately has 10% post-consumer recycled content, although this says 10% recycled, so you don't know necessarily if it is or not. And, um, but EPA's guideline for this product category is 30%. So yeah, it's legitimate, but it's, it's weak. And so we're trying to get the companies uh, that offer these products to not label this as an environmentally preferable product if it's below a um, legitimate uh, uh, guideline, and EPA's guidelines is one that we follow. And we also are working in a, with a broader group of organizations through the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council to make sure we're all asking for the same things so that we can all gang up on them and say, hey, this is, a, this is not a legitimate claim. Um, some of the claims are outdated. Here's an example that's current, but it shows um, a compact fluorescent light bulb saying Energy Star. Energy Star stopped certifying compact fluorescent light bulbs several years ago, and so we want the information to be current so that um, it is not misleading because it's just outdated. So, with all that as background, I'm going to show you how you can gear up and really uh, uh, use eco labels to make your job easier. So, legitimate eco labels, um, uh, in the case where there are them, uh, certifiers do the evaluation uh, work for you. So, it can be really hard. I remember um, when we first start, started, we said, We want a green cleaning product, and we would get the vendors to set us like a box of <laughs> this is our fish toxicity data and everything. I'm like, I don't know if this is, you know green or not. So certifiers do that work. Safer Choice, Green Seal, Cradle to Cradle, some of these other organizations, they take all that technical data and they will say yes, based on standards that we've all agreed upon, this is an environmentally preferable product and we can verify that these manufacturers' claims are accurate. Um, Ecolabels, from a purchasing startup point of view, can level the playing field for competing products. So if you say, all of the light bulbs have to be Energy Star certified, then anything that isn't, you just wouldn't accept in when you're uh, going out to bid, if you're involved in a bidding situation or if you're just looking for a product. Standards often include performance requirements, so we make sure the products will work, and certification registries can make it easy to find compliant products. So you can go to your clients and say, okay, we want a green cleaning product, then you figure out what the certifications are that apply to that cleaning product, and then you can go to the certifier's registries and look and make sure that that individual product is there, or if they're looking for a product, you say, look at all of these. An eco-label that's credible um, typically is de de developed by an independent third-party organization, not by the companies that manufacture the product or even the trade association. They're transparent. You can see what is it that makes this product um, green and what makes this eco-label credible. What is it based on? Um, ideally, it's participatory, which means that uh, industry as well as environmental groups can get in there and participate in the development of it. We do that a lot to make sure that those standards and eco-labels are actually strong and that it's a leadership standard, that it doesn't represent most of what's out there, that it really is usually the top 25% of the market. One thing to think about is there's this sea of eco-labels, some of them are single attribute, which means they may just verify one single thing. This is for Green Guard Gold. It's legitimate, but it only certifies that the product is certified low emitting, um, whereas uh, there are multi-attribute certifications. Safe Choice you heard a lot about today. Green Seal is another one. 
they look at multiple attributes. Not only is the product low emitting, but it also doesn't have carcinogens, doesn't have asthmogens, you know, so there's a whole list of things. So if you're comparing two eco labels, look for ones first that are multi attribute. If there's not products, you can drop down to a single attribute. Energy Star is another one looking at our life cycle. This one um, addresses energy efficiency. Um, then there's an a, a, a eco label for computers, for example, uh, called EP. How many people have heard of EP? Just raise your hands. Okay, most people. So it's the Electronic Products Environmental Assessment Tool, rates computers based on all kinds of different criteria, low energy consumption, low, fewer hazardous materials and emissions, product recycling, and it gets, uh, you know, uh, like the Olympic bronze, silver, gold rating, and you can see um, all the different things, and it's transparent. You can figure out how it got its rating. So we really rely on these multi-attribute, transparent third-party certifications to do the job for us. So you try to go out to a company and say, hey, you know, we want you to buy green products. And the first thing they're gonna ask you is, are those products available? Um, do they work well? And how much do they cost? And so I'm gonna take you through how you can answer and find information about all of those um, issues. So if you're trying to figure out what's green and you don't know what the spec is already, um, you can look to see, has any other jurisdiction adopted a specification for this product category? Now, some are going to be very complicated. This is New York's um, specification, but many states in particular have adopted specifications um, for environmental products, and you can just recycle those, cut and paste them into your um, uh, into your bid specifications if somebody is going up to bid, or this is what you can advise your clients to do. Um, EPA has guidance on green purchasing. You can see it's by different product categories. You can click there and they'll tell you which certifications apply to this category um, and uh, other types of purchasing guidance. Um, how do NGOs uh, define green? Sometimes the NGOs, often the NGOs are ahead of where the government is. So if something's on their radar screen, they can identify the products and they can the problems, and they also can identify uh, and give purchasing guidance. Many of the NGOs are getting into the green purchasing area. Center for Environmental Health, where you uh, uh, they are they've done a lot of work in foodware, furniture, flooring, um, as well as other things. SBLC, which I just mentioned, has done work. We just came out with an office supplies. Uh, set of specifications for about 25 product categories. They also have been very active in climate change and refrigerants. Um, this is another PFAS, TDM the toxics, there's other groups. Um, RPM, my organization has done work and come out with guidance. This is one on bee friendly purchasing. So there's lots of guidance documents out there that you can um, look for. So um, use the certifiers registries. If a certification doesn't have a registry, it makes it much less valuable. So we have been talking to a lot of certifiers about how to make the registries the most valuable that they can be. So this is one. Energy Star is one of the first ones that got into doing a registry. So you can look up all these different types. I'm sorry it's so small. But you can see there's appliances and building materials. You can click on there. You can see how many products um, there are. You can see what manufacturers um, offer those products. And then give that information to your clients and say, here, see if you can find a, a product that has um, it, that is on this list. One of the things that's really fantastic that Energy Star just did, and I just discovered it, is say it's an air conditioner. They list the air conditioners on there, and then there's a little place where you can click, and it says, uh, look for the ones that also have climate-friendly refrigerants. This is fantastic, and so you can then sub filter it down to get those. There's also an Energy Star Most Efficient, which is a top tier uh, for energy efficiency. Uh oh, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> and so yeah, you can click and then it will just you know come up with a list of products. You can view those products, etc. Um, EP has a registry for all the different types of products that it has, computers and imaging equipment like printers, mobile phones and things, and you can see how many uh, products are there and sort all different ways. You can even get in there and see which ones are the most efficient, which ones had um, more toxics reduction, types of credits, etc. So they're, they're um, really good at um, being transparent with their registry. Safer choice, of course. 
So you can search by um, the company, you can search by product type, you probably got everything you need to know about <laughs> super choice uh, earlier today. Um, it's important to note that some products have multiple third-party certifications that apply to them. And so that can give you more options to work with um, as long as the third-party certifications are um, roughly equivalent. Um, so for cleaning products, we typically recommend Green Seal, Safer Choice, and EcoLogo. Green Seal is more for the high volume products, um, usually concentrates. Safer Choice is more, tends to be more um, uh, specialty products, so they have a lot more in that area. EcoLogo is probably the weakest link at this point. They're updating their standards about 10 years old, so we're working with them. Used to be a Canadian uh, standard, but it was um, bought up by UL, the company that um, makes sure your refrigerator doesn't shock you. Um, if you want more information on cleaning products, you can go to our website. <laughs> Um, so to make this process easier, so you don't have to go to Green Sales website and then go to Safer Choices website and then go to Google's website and check everything to try to figure it out, these new environmental certification data aggregators, aggregators, aggregators have uh, popped up. And what they do is they take information from multiple certifiers and put it on one platform. So you can now see um, all the information from multiple certifiers on here, you don't have to go to the different websites. They're still in the beta stage, I would say, um, in terms of trying to compare apples to apples and make sure that's the same information that's on the vendor's websites, but this is a really good uh, place to start if you're trying to figure out what uh, environmental attributes and certifications apply. When there aren't certified products, however, it makes it um, very difficult. But this is clean products, so I just did a, a, a model search, and you can see there's lots of different um, certifications that apply. We only accept some of them, and we can talk later over a beer if you want to know why some we accept and some we don't. Um, but uh, you can look and see what products are certified, and then you can click in there and um, get the names of the products to check products um, uh, to see if they're certified. So as I mentioned, when you have an uncertified claim, it's really difficult to figure out um, you know, if the product uh, claim is real. And it's something that we're talking to a lot of the certifiers about taking stuff on. That said, there are some claims that are pretty obvious and inherent. So if it's a remanufactured toner cartridge or a rechargeable battery or a refillable pen, or a concentrated cleaner, or a solar powered anything, um, or it's made with recycled content as long as they give you the amount of recycled content, uh, especially the post-consumer recycled, it should be fine. But most of these claims are not verified, and that sometimes uh, can lead to, to trouble. So sometimes you'll see, um, it's like a bad telephone tag game. The manufacturer will say this product has 100% recycled content, then the vendor that sells that product will say it's 100% post-consumer, and then you have to go back and try to figure out which one it is. EPA has set standards for recycled content when they're advising their purchasers on what to buy, and there's lots of uh, products that have minimum recycled content standards. They are confusing, and they are older, from the 90s. They need to be updated. We need to just have post-consumer. California finally threw its hands up and said, we're just going with 30% post-consumer, that's it. And so it makes it a lot easier. But this and most of these claims are not verified. Um, the vendors, so most of the time, you're not buying directly from the manufacturer, you're buying from a vendor that sells it, it's like all the supplies. And um, the, the, the vendors have done a good job in many cases at starting to ID those products. You can see this is Staples, Eco ID just picked, most of them have some kind of filtering system for um, helping you to navigate towards those green products. They don't take away often, unless you make them do this, the, the non-green products, but they will label the green products. So there is Eco, the, you know, Eco ID, um, so you can see uh, what information is on there and why it will tell you 100% recycled post-consumer. So you want to really get that te technical information. Oh, hello. I'm going to have to come over here. Um, in general, rule of thumb, the vendor information is not as reliable as the manufacturer information. 
um, in which they found that the recharge was actually lasted longer than the single-use batteries, green cleaners, hand dryers, so any different types of products, you can test them to just make sure they're going to work before you roll it out. Um, you, then once you have worked with that entity to put the green products onto a contract, if you're dealing with a contract, make sure you're really promoting it. So do a little fact sheet that says, hey, we have this new contract for green cleaners or green paints. Here's the products that we've um, uh, approved. Here's the certifications that we have. Here's the vendors that offer those products. And then don't forget to get credit for the great work that you're doing. Track and report your results. Um, we've worked with a couple entities over the last couple of years. Washington State just came up with their first EPP um, uh, annual report uh, for some of the great work they're doing, and San Francisco has been doing it for a long time. So that's um, the overview. Um, I'll be here if anyone has questions, happy to um, answer them at the end or talk with you um, over here. Thank you, Alicia. That was great. You all can see that Alicia has quite a knowledge base and a variety of products and a lot of experience uh, since she started when she was two. <laughs> uh, I know, I am. <laughs> so our next presenter is Stacy Foreman. Stacy manages the City of Portland's Sustainable Procurement Program, driving change for more sustainable products and services through public contracting. Stacy is active in a variety of regional and national efforts to build sustainable procurement resources. She served on a number of related advisory committees and boards for Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council, which is one that Alicia mentioned. And those of you who are doing EPP stuff know that the action is in the specifications. So Stacy's very active in that space. Um, many other places. She's a lead accredited professional and presented to national and international audiences on the topic of sustainability and public procurement. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so Alicia did a fabulous job talking about uh, eco labels and kind of the nitty gritty of what to look for in terms of how to define a more sustainable product. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the implementation side, what the programming looks like, um, but also kind of just, you know, a lot of this um, also involves change management in terms of trying to get buy-in from the stakeholders that are actually using these things. So I'm going to talk, most of my dis discussion today is going to be along those lines. So program, we talk a little bit about uh, the city's program um, and then really dive into some examples. So just so you know where I'm coming from, um, you know, at the city of Portland, we do have a very strong uh, sustainable procurement policy that kind of forms the backbone and gives my program its kind of legal legit legitimacy to take on various actions and programs and initiatives. Um, I am housed in our central procurement office, which is a little different than a lot of agencies. A lot of agencies have their uh, sustainable procurement folks in their environmental department. Um, and I have a small, uh, scrappy budget uh, <laughs> to, to do a few, few things. And then every now and then I, I uh, get a few blunt ten funds to take on some very specific initiatives. But the reason I put this up here is to give you some context, because um, I'll be talking about prioritization. Um, and a lot of that prioritization really has to happen because, um, you know, a lot of people don't have a lot of time or a lot of resources to really do as much work as they really could be doing, right? There's a lot of potential for this kind of work. Um, but unfortunately, they're not always extremely well funded. Um, so along those lines, when developing our uh, program strategy, really thinking about um, are we truly understanding our impacts of our spend? Um, are we then thinking about what's most important in terms of prioritizing, not only about um, the impacts, but about how that might align with our agency's values or other synergies or other program synergies? Where can we kind of build on leverage? Um, and then thinking about how we're going to take that action and then how are we going to build off of that for continuous improvement. 
So in terms of what that looks like in my actual program, um, I kind of wear three hats. Uh, one is I work on building up everyday resources. These are the kind of resources that um, don't change very often or are very uh, static. They can be cut and paste specs. There can be all these references like Alicia was saying in terms of you know, for green cleaning products, we know that we want to specify, you know, green seal, safer choice, echo logo, all those. Um, those are kind of our cut and paste specs. And um, they're the tools that our procurement staff and our uh, bureau procurement staff use as well. Um, and then when something is kind of, um, when I need to wear more of the change management hat and more of the project management hat, um, those are for more of our emerging pilot projects or where we need to really do proof of concept and those are some of the projects I'm going to talk about next. And then lastly, I serve as more of a subject matter expert in our uh, in the city regarding sustainable procurement and sustainable products and we're going to look for best practices or kind of doing that ongoing research and answering questions for staff. <coughs> So I know this is kind of a busy side, but it gives a little bit of an example of let's see, oh, it does point um, of some of those basic resources I was talking about that I provide and develop for uh, for staff in terms of program resources. So I have this sustainable procurement guide. It's a two-page guide. It kind of gives you the what, where, why of an action. So it provides not only the hint of what our minimum requirements are for uh, a product or service area, but also about like how do we go about procuring it in the city, what to look for. Um, on the back, the reverse side of this is a little bit more about the why. Like why, why are we doing this? Why are we focusing on toxics and electronics? Um, what is it about that that's a hot spot? Um, and what is the benefit achieved by taking these actions? And then I have uh, a whole lot of cut and paste things. A lot of um, the folks, you know, some folks really want to know the details and the why, but others just like, just tell me what to do, cut and paste. Um, and that's what we do, we provide some of that cut and paste. It's about meeting them where, the, where they're at and what they need to know to get their job done. Um, but for those who also want to know more, uh, we do have a lot of um, online resources. This is stuff that's internal like an internal uh, employee page where they can go in and they can say, oh, what are conflict minerals? Never heard of that. And they can type in, they can go in there and look and find it defined for them. Um, and then I also try to keep in front of them and remind them, you know, if I don't work with, I'm not gonna be working with every city employee all the time, but I try to stay in contact and try to stay in touch with folks through a monthly newsletter, which is an example right down there. So those are kind of like the ongoing basic um, programming work that I do to try to keep sustainable procurement in front of people, to try to keep it easily accessible to them and um, be able to just take certain things and run with it. But there's also things that I need to do with, you know, you can't just take it and run with it. It's not as simple as that. There's some change management that needs to really happen. So one of the first examples I want to talk about is uh, work that I did a few years ago, switching our parks department's um, janitorial cleaning products. And at the time, our janitorial cleaning products were being sourced and provided by the janitorial service provider. So um, we weren't buying the products our service provider was. And even though we had um, requirements in that contract saying they had to use, you know, the green seal, the safer choice, the logo, what have you. Um, it wasn't always consistent, um, and there was some other issues regarding um, inventory control and and kind of weird pricing that we weren't very happy with. So, decided to pull the products out from that service agreement, and then. Um, instead make, have our parks department staff order the product and provide it for the janitorial service provider. So you can see where this, where we run into a change management issue here, right? Because we're adding a new responsibility onto some existing staff, and um, but also the fact that another party has to actually use the products, right? So um, a little bit, there's a lot of moving parts there. But, um, so we did, we first, these are the kind of steps that I'm gonna walk through in terms of how we went about doing this. 
So we established the price agreement, and we did all the things that Alicia was just talking about in terms of like all the minimum requirements reference a like green cleaning product. Um, they were all certified to a third party standard. Uh, the paper products were all, uh, you know, met the EPA CPGs, um, recycled content, et cetera. Um, but the other thing we did prior to executing this price agreement is really understanding the end user values uh, beyond just the safer products. Um, you know, and this kind of gets to my uh, other philosophy about implementing this work is, you know, when working with stakeholders, I try to really either uh, what I call remove a pain or provide a gain. So um, one of the things that the building staff were having problems with before was inventory control. They'd have a big event over a weekend, they'd run out of toilet paper, and they'd be like, oh, you know. <laughs> Very bad words. You, know, you don't want a huge uh, community center full of people and no toilet paper, let me tell you. Um, so somebody would end up having to run down to the store, like the nearest Fred Meyer, and go grab some more toilet paper. Um, but they also need to make sure everything was very easy to order, that they were getting timely delivery. But standardization was another thing that was helpful for them because staff move around those community centers. They don't stay in one community center in Orlando all the time, and they tend to move around. So having some standardization helped. Um, we learned from janitorial staff, not only, you know, they had concerns about um, performance of the products, obviously, but also really important to them was not coming into contact with any concentrated chemicals. So really made sure our specs reflect sealed auto dilution for concentrated chemicals. And the facility staff also said, we can't have anything wall mounted. So no dilution control stuff that's wall mounted. We don't want that in our facilities. So we got that price agreement up and running. We met all those needs. Then it's about, okay, how do we actually go about doing this? Um, and of course, management's concerned that this is gonna suck a lot of time from their staff, the staff are gonna complain, they don't wanna, you know, this is one more thing that they have to do. So really had to go in and think about um, how to make this easy for folks. And uh, fortunately, we kind of tested this um, in a pilot. We only did this in two community centers first to kind of work out the kinks. Um, how to make it easy, we set up some um, building specific product lists. Um, so it's like having an approved product list per building. So um, they could go into the ordering site, click on their building, and they would see only the products that were approved to be used in that site that the janitorial staff would then be used, you know, were expecting to see. So that kind of narrowed everything down. They weren't going into a giant catalog or anything to try to find their products. They could just go to their list and order directly from that. Um, and then we established some protocols about who's gonna do what and how they're gonna communicate between the parties. But once we got that kind of ironed out in the pilot test, we were able to go and scale up. But you can imagine Parks is also like, oh my gosh, this still seems like a lot of work, going in, training people, getting that all organized. So, that's where I stepped in, and I and I um, am probably the only city staff person that's ever been in every single community center janitorial closet. Um, so maybe I should add that to my resume. It's pretty exciting. Um, I have to say the most interesting one was at our Portland Tennis Center, where the janitorial closet was in the back of the men's locker room. So let me tell you, that was a lot of fun figuring that out, how to switch that up during operational hours. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, so I did, I did that hands-on work of thinking about like going out, cleaning up all the old chemical, getting it properly disposed of, um, and then organizing the new and labeling the shelves and everything to make it easier for them because they really are also pressed for time. And um, this really helped uh, also give me like, you know, um, you know it, it built goodwill with these stakeholders, right? They really appreciated this and um, it made the whole process uh, a lot easier for them to accept a new change. And then of course, reporting back on results, as Alicia mentioned, um, you know, taking account of what you did and what, what benefits were drawn from it. Um, asking staff, how did you appreciate the work? Did it go well? Did it go smoothly? Um, you know, identifying benefits and drawbacks, hopefully the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, and then cost impacts. And I'm happy to say that um, 
you know, staff feedback in this case was really positive. The benefits did outweigh the drawbacks, and um, I was able to save our parks department between twenty and forty thousand dollars annually by doing this, as well as standardizing around green cleaning products. So, um, so the other one I want to highlight um, is a little different, um, but some similarities is right now I'm in the midst of low carbon concrete. And if you've never really thought about what that means, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're gonna start hearing a lot more about it if you haven't already. Um, it's, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, concrete's just a very energy intensive material, mostly because manufacturing cement is extremely energy intensive. It, you know, they heat it to really high temperatures um, to produce cement, and then it actually, the chemical process actually releases CO2 as well. So it's a very um, energy intensive and greenhouse gas intensive material. Um, and then, uh, but at the same time, it's also ubiquitous, um, right? It's everywhere, it's used all over the place. I think I heard someone say that um, in terms of a material consumed globally, it's only second to water. Like we use a lot of concrete globally everywhere. Um, so, uh, but it's also very structured and controlled. Um, I can't just go in and write a spec and say, you know, you're gonna go start using low carbon concrete now. They're gonna be like, no, 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 wait a minute. Like you, it still has to meet ASTM standard this and ACI standard this and you know, there's a lot of concerns um, from an engineering perspective about messing with concrete. Um, so in terms of like how to go about implementing this and um, again, change management, really understanding who are the key subject matter experts, who the decision makers are, who are the, um, who really needs to buy in, who's writing these specification at the end of the day, who's gonna be like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Um, and getting their buy-in. Um, getting some data to understand, like, well, what kinds of mixes are we using? What's the, what's the embodied carbon of our mixes now? Um, so that we can set meaningful, hopefully meaningful change. Um, and then understanding all their different concerns. I had um, concerns such as like, well, what if that, what if that concrete that you, low carbon concrete somehow interferes with my ability to, to read an underground utility? line, um, you know, they're out there sensing underneath the concrete, right, like what underground utilities are there, like what if the new concrete messes with that, that was something I hadn't even thought about, but it's one of those stakeholder concerns that from a scientific point, I can't think of anything in the concrete that would interfere with that, but at the same time, they wanted proof that it wasn't going to interfere, right, so we tested that too. Um, so we did lots of pilot tests, reported on findings, continued testing, um, and also involved a lot of different stakeholders. So I also had an oversight committee that was made up of engineers, con um, the concrete suppliers, the contractors that actually finished the concrete. So um, basically, you know, unlike some other product categories where, uh, you know, specifying something like recycled content paper, well, I guess maybe I shouldn't use that as sample so the people are really sensitive about their paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it did take a lot of hand-holding and a lot of um, kind of just walking through and guiding the change as you went along. Um, so here's my imagery from all that. Uh, up here is like one of our first whiteboard exercises of what do we want our pilot tests to look like? What do we want to know? What do we want to measure? Things like finishability and workability, and this weird word called slump, which I never thought was like a real term, but it really is a real term with concrete, the slump. Um, you know, so all these different kinds of things, and getting to know who can help me figure out, um, you know, all these different elements and report back on, okay, yes, when we switch to these lower carbon mixes, we can still meet all these other expectations. Um, we did some testing, that's what it looks like when you get cylinders, um, take cylinder samples and then you run them to a lab and they all eventually get smashed by a giant machine that tests their compressive strength. Um, and then we get those test results back to make sure that these things are performing adequately and we look at 
you know, um, here's a list of all the different kinds of stakeholders we have and how we're reporting back on them and all the data. And I just bring this up because, um, you know, it's, as we move towards uh, looking for funding or you're helping other folks with funding for these kind of more challenging projects, think about when you're putting proposals together, you're thinking about um, how you might help assist other bureaus, sorry, not bureaus, but other businesses, um, like build this into, build this kind of stakeholder engagement and stakeholder um, change management kind of approach into those two, or you might have to take that into account depending on the scope of the work you're doing with those businesses. Um, so lastly, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, in terms of what I've seen work in terms of implementation, really prioritizing, that prioritization can happen in many different ways. Maybe it's just that it aligns very well with that organization's goals, or there's a lot of synergies there. Maybe it's prioritization around high impact. Um, really building those stakeholder buy-ins, uh, change management approaches. I really like trying, even if it's not in any way related to um, you know, greening a product uh, like it was with, for me with inventory control, like just gaining that trust and gaining that um, goodwill with a stakeholder really helped um, transition to greener products, even though it had really nothing to do with greener products. Um, and then making the process change as easy as possible. So all I, at the end of the day, hopefully all I have to do is click a button and to make the change that we want them to make. Um, and then keeping in front of them reoccurring communi communication engagement. Um, let your stakeholders know that you're there, even when you don't need anything from them or you're not asking for a change. The last thing you want to do is to show up only when you want something from them, right? So um, trying to stay in communication, stay in touch, ask them how it's going, things along those things. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I, my marketing friend says that you have to make things fun, easy, and popular if you want people to change. And it, and on my bio that we didn't read, I say technical solutions are part of the answer, but it takes more than a new technology or cost savings to get people to change. So I really appreciate that you have highlighted that in your presentation.